Okay. So last talk for today before the wrap up, uh, same speaker, AES70, uh, control protocol this time for audio. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, in case um, anyone wasn't here for the last one, uh, hello, I'm Conrad Bevington. I'm here from uh, Focusrite. Uh, we do audio interfaces and uh, various audio devices. So this is a talk on the AES-70 protocol. It's a standard for controlling audio devices on, a net on an audio network. So um, in case anyone wasn't here uh, just now, um, uh, Pro Audio is dealing with uh, areas like live sound, like studio, and like broadcast. Um, we have various uh, devices for inputs, so microphones and preamps, uh, outputs to amplifiers and speakers, and in the middle there's processing, mixers, effects, those sorts of devices. Um, I, I, yeah, I know, I know this is repeated, but I, um, in case everyone uh, was new. Uh, so typical setup has some equipment on the stage, some equipment um, at the back <laughs> of the room where the, in the uh, audio area. Uh, for mixing, for recording, and so signals come from the stage, get mixed, recorded, and then can be sent back out for front of house sound and for stage monitoring. That's, that's a fairly typical setup. So for AES-70, the motivations were slightly different than the AES-67 standard. This is about controlling the devices. So uh, with an audio network, because we we're taking audio in at, as close to the source as possible. Uh, we're not running long analog cables. It means things like the actual equipment, your microphone preamplifiers, for instance, can be placed in quite inconvenient locations. They can be in the recording room or on the side of the stage. Um, so that was one of the main motivations for the uh, control protocol. There are existing protocols. Uh, they're generally proprietary and and they, uh, again, they, inter they interrupt poorly with uh, other manufacturers' equipment. Um, so there was a need to improve that. And there was also a need to uh, allow integration of actual physical hardware controllers. So maybe your console can, uh, can communicate with your microphone preamps and your outputs and all be integrated into a single network. And of course, there's um, a need to AES-67 didn't specify uh, control, and uh, so uh, having a complementary standard that does that, that kind of fills in the gap. So there's two terms, and they're generally used interchangeably, but might as well get them out of the way. Uh, AES-70 is a standards document uh, specifying the control protocol, and OCA uh, stands for uh, Open Control Architecture, that's the actual protocol just specified by the standard. In most cases, uh, terminology seems to be quite uh, inter interchangeable. So the standard is split into three areas. There's a framework. There's a class structure specifying a kind of list of a tree, really, of classes of uh, things that can be controlled. And there's communication protocols, so how we actually get the messages for um, for doing the, uh, the uh, control. So the framework itself, it's object-oriented. Um, um, a AS-70 device is uh, specified as being composed of a number of objects. And the framework allows only for single inheritance. So um, there are no things like there's no interface classes or anything like that. It's just a single inheritance tree. Classes, um, so um, in the standard, classes are allowed to have methods, properties, and they're allowed to generate events, which is your feedback mechanism for, for sending updates back to a controller. Um, there is a single root class called OCA root, and um, in order to define what class an object is, there is a class ID, which is composed of class numbering for each level of the inheritance hierarchy. And the standard does make some uh, allowances for proprietary subclasses. So if you want to uh, implement a non-standard control, you can put it in a proprietary subclass. Um, 
and standard controllers will be able to access your superclass <laughs> methods wherever you leave the standard tree and a custom proprietary controller can access the extended methods. So this is just an example of how our class ID works. We have inheritance and at each level we add another ID onto our, onto our class ID. It's, uh, they're just uh, numbered at each level. So the methods themselves, uh, they do typical object-oriented method things. They retrieve properties, they perform actions. And as we have single inheritance, it's all very well defined that each method has a level as how far down the tree it is. And then on each level of the tree, uh, the methods are just specified with method numbers. So uh, again, uh, we have examples of uh, methods. And if you want to call this method, you go down to level four. I, I don't know why it's uh, one index and not zero index. But, and you go across on this level to method number two. And that's how you specify a method. And it's all very well defined like that. So we've ha got this object tree. And every class inherits from OCA root. So this is actually quite a, um, a rich class. It allows quite a lot of functionality in the base class of everything. So um, it's, uh, it allows you to specify a role for the class. And that's just a string that's <coughs> intended for human readable use. So for example, it might be uh, channel 1 gain or, or uh, you know, channel 5 input source. That's the typical sort of thing that would go into that. Um, there's notifications on when any property of the class changes. So uh, receiving updates from your control device is quite easy. You just subscribe to that one notification and you get all of the property updates on your control device. And there's also a locking mechanism. So a particular controller can just take ownership of a particular um, object in the, in the device and say, I control this exclusively and no other controllers are allowed are allowed it. So that was the base class. And now we have a rough outline of our class hierarchy. It's quite dense and rich, so did, uh, don't worry about the uh, details there. But uh, the built-in classes are split into three main groups, and then workers has a subgroup, has uh, subgrouping. The actual signal processing happens in workers. Um, managers and agents kind of deal with more global state of the device in various capacities. So uh, typical workers are the sensors. Um, these can detect um, any inputs. Um, these can be level sensors, so actually measuring the signal. Or they can be other things like uh, switch states on the input. So, um, Various, of various uh, types. And then uh, the actual work of signal processing is done by actuators. Um, so th these uh, range from the simple stuff like just applying gain all the way through to uh, complicated things like filtering, uh, parametric EQ. Um, so it, there's, a quite a, there's quite a rich range of classes there um, to work with. Um, which covers most typical audio signal processing um, um, use cases. So once we've got these classes and we've made objects, we can group them into blocks. Uh, these blocks don't really have a signal processing function. They're more for <laughs> the actual um, logical layout of the, of the device. So, um, for instance, you would typically group um, a single channel of uh, signal processing into a single block um, just to uh, make it clear that this, what the functionality is relating to. Um, they, they can be nested, they can contain other workers, and they have uh, methods for describing the signal flow of the, uh, of the signal within the block. So, in a typical case, um, each worker within a block would have some ports for input and output. And the block that contains them all, this uh, big outer rectangle, uh, you call a method on it to describe the signal flow. And it tells you 
this is connected to these, this output's connected to this switch, um, and it just enumerates all of the, all of the uh, signal path connections like that. So uh, this is a typical example uh, from a microphone preamplifier. We have some inputs. We choose a particular input uh, using the switch. We can apply gain to it and optionally uh, filter off the low frequencies. So outside of the workers for doing signal processing, there are managers and agents. Managers uh, are quite typically global controls. So, um, so the uh, mandatory ones uh, all deal with uh, the device uh, on some level. So uh, there's, uh, there's describing what the device actually is and what firmwares are on it. Um, there's a subscription manager, which is mandatory, which is part of the event handling mechanism for allowing uh, controllers to actually receive events from the device. And there's some network information um, uh, available. There's also quite a rich range of um, optional managers um, dealing with uh, various areas around security, clocking, and yeah, just the general settings. Um, these, these aren't quite so important, and so they're made optional. The agents, there's actually only one mandatory agent, and that's called the stream network. This provides the mechanism for setting up uh, connections between your audio device and other audio devices. It's the uh, mechanism for connecting them together. Um, that's mandatory, and it can be any subclass of stream network. So, for example, it could be an AES67 stream network, it could be a Dante stream network if you have a proprietary device, it could be any of those. The optional agents, um, these are generally um, related to, um, to handling controls. So, for example, you can group controls together with a grouper or you can affect control over time with a ramper. That would be a typical example of that would be doing a fade in. So you just send one message to the ramper that uh, gain must ramp up over a certain period of time, and that would be handled. Um, observers um, are, are, again, uh, just a slightly different report back mechanism. And there's also uh, handling of media clock. And finally, the other half of the event handling mechanism is the event handler itself which is an agent which can be implemented on a controller and not the controlled device. So for the event handling, um, both the controller and the controlled device are OCA devices. That's a critical part of this process. Uh, um, the controller implements the event handler, the controlled device implements the subscription manager, and the controller then uses the subscription manager on the control device to register for what events it will need. And when, event, uh, when notifications come back through over the network, um, those are just treated like method calls um, on the event handler. So, so our, our, our method call mechanism works in both directions. So that's the structure, thus classes, and the uh, agents and managers and what's in there. Now we need to look at how to uh, communicate this with these things. And there's, um, there's scope for multiple protocols in uh, AES 70. Currently there's one protocol defined, which is a TCP IP protocol. Uh, in the future there's um, planning in place for doing uh, control over UDP for um, smaller embedded devices which can't necessarily handle full TCP. Um, there's also the possibility of doing control over USB. So that would kind of um, standardize um, the control mechanism that your, no matter how your device happens to be connected at the time, it uses the same control mechanism. So OCP.1 is, is um, the TCP IP uh, control protocol. It defines a discovery mechanism, the message format, and the, uh, optionally, some TLS and um, 
heartbeats for um, monitoring device presence. Discovery is uh, done by uh, DNS service discovery with uh, multicast DNS. There's a couple of text records um, specified within the standard just so that um, devices can know what type of, uh, what version of the protocol they are connecting to. And yeah, they, um, the actual uh, service types are also specified. The message format uh, used itself uh, on the protocol is a binary format. It has various message types for uh, the different uh, situations and um, it also specifies fully the uh, data marshalling so that you can pr provide parameters um, on your message. So for example, you can provide method parameters or responses. Um, it's a fairly, I haven't actually written it up here, but it's just a fairly standard uh, binary format type, type thing. So that's the, um, that's the uh, controls and the protocols. So now we have the organizations. Again, uh, uh, obviously the AES is involved. Um, the, again, standardization, technical discussion. There's also um, an alliance of companies called the OCA Alliance. Uh, they handle more of the promotion of the standard, um, encouraging adoption, and um, actual uh, discussions of the practical implementation tend to happen under the OCA Alliance. So the current OCA Alliance members, uh, these are the full members. Um, there's, again, there's also associate membership. Um, they tend to be um, audio equipment manufacturers, Focusrite's in there, Yamaha's in there, uh, DMB, etc. cetera. Um, so it's quite wide uh, across the uh, audio industry. And um, as this is more of a control protocol, there are actually implementations available. Um, so um, there's, a, there's a sample implementation called OCA Micro. micro. This is uh, designed for embedded devices and uh, that's intended more as a, as a kind of dev kit. So if you download that, you actually get um, some source code uh, demonstrating the, uh, the implementation of, uh, of AES 70. And there's um, some electronic schematics for a dev board that will run this, this code. The OCAJS is more of a client side implementation. So for implementing controller applications, that can run in your browser and generate OCA commands to control various things on your network. Um, so, um, so that's uh, quite easy to get up and running and get started with. So we've so they've got implementations and finally just summing up the benefits, having a standard protocol um, um, is, allows a better interop it's, and it allows um, the possibility of things like custom controllers, of hardware controllers to uh, interact with the audio network. Um, it makes a good fit with AES67 and the structure used, the uh, um, object oriented structure allows for easy extension where, where needed. So yes, for more information, uh, there's the OCA Alliance, there's the AES, and there's the downloads for the uh, implementations. Thank you. Um, AES 70, so yes. Okay, so the question is, what does? Where is it, uh, yeah, yes, yeah. Okay, the the question is, what does uh, AES 70 bring that um, OSC, um, Open Sound Control, uh, couldn't handle? Um, I'd say it's more in terms of the specialization. Um, so OSC was more focused towards. Um, being kind of a MIDI replacement for instrument products for uh, that market. 
and this is more focused towards the high-end pro audio market. Um, so we, we just see a different focus in um, kind of what objects are implemented in the protocols and what controls they allow. Oh, thank you, thank